Maureen is currently completing a master's in modern Irish at NUI Galway um, and the, her paper today is entitled um, May Your Sleep Be Restful, Revealing Secrets and Repelling Threats in Gaelic Lullabies. Um, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Mark. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, as you said there, my name is Maureen Nichanowen and I've been studying um, I've been studying Gaelic lullabies from the Irish folk song tradition and particularly focusing on what these songs can tell us about women's experience and um, how they can give us an insight into domestic life and into society as a whole. And although these songs feature in Irish folklore collections and recordings, they don't have the same status as some other types of song, love songs or laments and songs that record events that are specific to a person or a time. And lullabies, on the other hand, may seem nonsensical, often revolving around meaningless vocables or shully guiche with uh, disjointed verses that seem to make no sense and uh, with the function of soothing a child. And they could easily be dismissed as their intended audience as children, and so they might be viewed as unimportant or merely child's play. And so this paper is based on work in Irish, and um, while there are translations for much of what I'm talking about. In some cases, I've included my own rough translation. And just in terms of time, um, I, I won't play any recordings, but I, I will try and give you an idea of what some of these um, sound like. So I was initially drawn to lullabies as there can be a stark contrast between beautiful, soothing melodies and lyrics that are darker or troubling or uneasy. And in this paper, I'll show some examples of lullabies to discuss how these songs can give us a valuable insight into women's lives and their roles in society. So the explicit function of a lullaby is to put a child to sleep and to express love for the infant. And there are some lullabies which do just that, such as this one here, Dun the Hul, or Close Your Eyes, which sounds, this particular version sounds something like this. Dun the Hul, and this particular lullaby is an example of what Leslie Jacob refers to as affirming the all rightness of the world. You see in this verse here that you've got the father returning home and the promise of a gift throughout. And both the words and the melody are coaxing the child, enticing them to go to sleep. In an interview available on joheaney.org, um, the singer Joseph O'Haney, or Joanne New as he's known, describes this as promising everything, you know, promising but hoping that he'll fall asleep without remembering the promises. <laughs> uh, a brief side note, as I mentioned, I'm focusing on these songs as sung by women, though of course they would also have been sung by men. And we can recognize male authorship in some of these through their titles, um, such as this one here. And um, this is something that Kira Thompson has remarked upon as well. But one such example is Shohin Sho Owen Rua i Huluwain. And here, interestingly, the promises pertain to the mythological world, to famous or historic adventures, as opposed to ordinary Irish rural life. So you see here, you'll get besides the golden fleece, which mighty Jason brought to Greece. Um, and the chorus expresses the function of the song explicitly. The, the promises are being made to persuade the infant to go to sleep. So don't cry for now, don't shed a tear. And the last few lines of the song shows, however, that there was no basis to these vows in the previous verses. Now that I see your mammy returning, I'll not promise you prize nor poem nor jewel. Uh, so to me, what's implied there is that the crying child can be handed over to somebody else, whether it's mammy or nurse or foster mother uh, to deal with now. Which brings me to another feature of the lullabies and uh, that they can allow the singer to vent their frustrations. And I think the lullaby allows a particular freedom to do so for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, there's a freedom in the intended audience being an infant. And so depending on the age of the child, they may be too young to understand the language. And so the singer can say what they like. So in their work in coding and folklore, Joan Radner and Susan Lancer discuss the various ways in which opinions and feelings can be expressed indirectly. And in discussing distraction, they specifically mention lullabies, talking about the, the noise that drowns out the message. 
uh, saying in folklore where the medium need not be solely verbal, one component of the performance like the beating of the pot can work to obliterate another. In lullabies, for example, a distressing text is frequently smothered by soothing melody and rhythms. So I'll return to the melodies themselves shortly. Um, to me, it's interesting that Lancer and Radner mentioned the banging on the pots to conceal meaning, because you could imagine in the case of lullabies that there may be another kind of distracting noise. And although the singer may have little control over it, um, the crying of a child could also conceal the lyrics of a song. And so what kinds of messages might be concealed uh, by these melodies and their context? Well, they're an opportunity for complaint and for dealing with sensitive topics. So take, for example, this fragment of a lullaby published in the Dundalk Democrat in 1913. So here you have questions of legitimately being openly aired. Um, it's me that's tormented over my child's father going to marry tomorrow morning. And um, the father's being cursed in this as well, in that second verse. And in another version discussed by Sarah Nick Luchlin, the singer curses him to hell, as that's where his friends are. And you can see in this third verse I've mentioned here, the blessings alongside the curses where the narrator wishes well for her child, although they've likely had a bad start in life uh, due to the circumstances. Um, the fact that these songs were carried on shows that it wasn't just a private audience of singer and infant and songs like these could have been sung by women who weren't married or who were married, but could take these songs to express their own emotions and frustrations in the guise of singing a simple lullaby. So in this next example, you can see the lullaby being used to take a, a dig at other women. And this sounds something like... <laughs> Is ni mara kharak brana mata so se bledin do mara lim bara akhli wanod sari awaka so you might see there there's wishful thinking in terms of the the um golden cradle but there's also a sense that the singer is expressing pride in her own care of the child but it's a pride that expresses classism, maybe also a certain arrogance, this idea that there's the wife of a buddha or a churl. Um, and the lullaby allows her to say these things freely. And Cara Delay's very interesting paper on uncharitable tongues explores how poor women retained their speaking power in a society that valued passivity and silence and long suffering Catholic wives. So for comparison's sake, I'll just pull from that paper, Reverend Bernard O'Reilly's instructional tract for Catholic women. So he says, be gentle. That does not mean to be spiritless. It means to be the opposite of violent, irascible, ill-tempered and moody, be low voiced. And I find this interesting, particularly in relation to expression in lullabies, as the singer would be low voiced and gentle and the act of singing itself would need to be the opposite of violent for the song to take effect. But you can hear, despite the pretty melody, that the singer can still make these snide remarks. And they can vent frustrations and express anger and be moody. Um, so in the same way that lullabies provide an opportunity to express hopes and wishes for the child, they're also preoccupied with the opposite of this idyllic life. And a fear of death is prevalent in them, whether it's expressly mentioned or alluded to in other ways. Take um, this example from the same lullaby. So you often see threats being named in lullabies. And one of the main threats in Irish society traditionally would be on Sloashi or the fairy folk. And Sloashi were particularly a threat to women and children, both of which could be taken into the list, the fairy fort and have a changeling or a lifeless version left in their place. And the folklore collector Sean O'Hochie says that um, they could do little harm without the help of a mortal, and this is why they often abducted people. He says, childbirth was the time they were most active in this way. Women and infants died and likenesses were left in their place. So the belief in fairy folk in society shows the fear that people had of that which was out of the ordinary, the person who was a little odd or away with the fairies, the child or the cow who was suddenly uh, inexplicably ill. 
And there's a connection between the fairy folk and the fear people had of death, particularly in the case of infants that died before baptism, which is something that Anne O'Connor explores in her work, The Blessed and the Damned. And she says there's a belief in Irish and European folklore that the fairies are actually the souls of unbaptized children. And you can get a sense of that um, even in looking how landscape is perceived. So Angela Burke talks about the places where you might meet a fairy saying the Irish fairies inhabit what is effectively non-place. People encounter them on boundaries, either in space, between townlands or on beaches between high and low tide, or in time, at dusk or at midnight, on Halloween or May Eve. And compare that to Anne O'Connor's description of the burial grounds of unbaptized infants, saying, in many parts of Ireland, people simply say that unbaptized children were buried in unconsecrated ground. Whether this was defined as under a boundary wall or in a ditch, at the seashore, at a crossroads, in a cliff face, or even in a dunghill. So these are shared liminal spaces that strengthen a connection between the fairy folk on the edges of society and the unbaptized child who won't be admitted into heaven. That's a brief context of fairy belief, which shapes that which we find in lullabies. The threat of abduction features strongly in lullabies. It's particularly noticeable in those that have little to no other text, um, the likes of which would have simply so you start there with the the vocables, which could be something like shohulo or hoshoin or something like that, a term of endearment, and then the order of banishment there and um, get out, bogeyman. Um, there are plenty of examples of lullabies warding off otherworldly invaders. So just taking one here, um, Shohin Show, which you can hear sung by Joanne you, and something like this. Ed Wallo Hoti Toshi O Pigalo, Fui Huyen Rayon Yaro, a game is a sport. Is Shoyu Ben Yuriel Hunkly Red Mulano, Lemian Le Harin Tishak Salismo. This is a particularly interesting one as the words are attributed to Eve Manya, which is the pseudonym of uh, the priest on Tahir Thomas O'Kale. This could raise questions about authenticity and considering the Catholic Church was opposed to folk beliefs and practices pertaining to the fairy people, it's certainly unusual. However, he was someone who was immersed in the Irish language and culture from an early age and the, the ideas expressed in this lullaby are in line with traditional thinking. So obviously these were taken on board by those who chose to sing it and to carry it on. And the melody itself we can take to be traditional, and indeed there's a version of it with that simple lyrical structure I just mentioned, um, collected from Michal Brianach at the beginning of the 20th century, that's in Oran Wishola. And the melody is very similar to that song by Joy New, with slightly differences in the first line. So the, the melody from Michal Brianach uh, is something like... Do me, so me, so me, re, 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 do, do me, fa, re, so fa, me, re, do, do. And the most noticeable difference there is that the melody sung by Heaney is um, simplified, omitting that fourth note fa, which makes it a, a pentatonic scale, a very popular scale in Irish lullabies, lots of whole tones giving that open, dreamy feel to them. And certainly in general, they tend to avoid sevenths or notes that introduce tension and need to resolve. And just lastly, I'd like to look at Hawaiian as sung by Sarafni Um So um, I've just mentioned one verse here and among other verses associated with the song, you have things like um, the priest's horse, has escaped into this field, it'll do damage, or um, what carriage will we give to a broken doll, a lobster pot with um, wheels under it. And so this one sounds something like this. Oh, I, oh, I, so I, more, oh, I, more, Oh, I'm Mulana, 
so I So again, this particular verse might seem nonsensical and particularly in the context of the other verses that are associated with it. But what's being hinted at here is abandonment, that your mother could leave and run off with uh, Philippa Ball. And so people could take this sentiment and sing it to express their own situation, whether somebody had left or somebody wanted to. And Sarcha also said of this song, uh, this is my sort of clumsy translation. I know there's one available here, but um, essentially is saying that everybody had their own version of it and could add to it and had, I suppose, creative expression as you would with a free form like that to sing whatever words you wanted to, to do the trick. Um, and so this shows the freedom of expression that the lullaby form allows. It also draws a comparison with the, the keen or the lament. And as I've mentioned, lullabies can be preoccupied with death. And of course, birth and death aren't two opposite ends of the spectrum, and particularly at a time where mortality rates were high among both women and infants. In the Keening tradition, women took an active, outspoken, performative role in the ritual of death and of grieving. And in the lullaby tradition, we see the same freedom of expression, but in normal time and in a domestic setting. So what you also find is songs that are centered around vocables, where uh, we have had shohin sho in the lullaby, you would have ochonon in the keen. And just like you can sing a lullaby with only these vocables, you could keen a person with only ochonon, and the basic sounds are all you need to, to keen or to calm a person. Um, so Maven Ikenarchini and Lilith Oleda in their work on laments and milking songs describe the melody of the lament as uh, so. The melody starts on a high note and falls like a sigh. Now you could argue that that's what you're hearing in, in Hawaiian, in the Lullaby Hawaiian. The ma majority of phrases start on a high note and descend uh, like a sigh. So once more. Hawaiian, Hawaiian. So I'm and compare that to um, Queen Artsy Lira, which um, you can hear Brandon and Madagon singing based on the, the Joyce manuscript. So just an approximation of it. Um, um, something like that. And so the melody in Hawaii, although it's in a different mode, and again, it's based on a pentatonic scale, it has a shared expression with the keen and the shape of the melody along with the free rhythm create a mournful feel. And they show a leaning towards the darkness, you know, whether that's to, to express fears and, or to threaten or to maybe face, face your fears and lean into that darkness. And between the words and the melody, love and lament are intertwined. So, as I mentioned, laments belong to a particular time where usual social norms don't apply and grieving allows a, a limited space where women can speak their minds freely, whereas lullabies belong to the everyday. But in their own way, they give women a chance to express themselves and to air their grievances or vent or, uh, you know, express themselves in an ordinary or domestic setting. So I think that's probably all I have time, time for. So, Gurmina Mahagi, thank you very much. Uh, I guess um, if we have time for questions, I'll do my best. Um, fabulous. Um, thank you very much um, for a really fascinating paper and, and beautiful demonstration of those lullabies. Um, we, we have to perhaps have time for one or two um, questions. If anybody um, would like to raise their hand and, and um, go ahead, I'll just give everyone a minute. Can I just say that uh... Your performance of those lullabies was excellent and uh, it added a, a whole dimension, especially to your analysis of the, of how the lullabies were constructed. It's just fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. A little rushed, probably faster than you'd want to <laughs> sing to an infant. But <laughs> I was nodding off halfway through one of them. <laughs>
Um, in the absence of anyone else jumping in, I'll take the, the um, chair's prerogative and ask a very uh, quick question, um, which was the really just curiosity about um, whether there's any regional variation um, with some of the, these different kind of themes um, in these lullabies, or, or, or if it, it's kind of quite universal. Um, I'm not sure now, thematically, uh, with the melodies, it's a little bit easier to trace. Um, and I have to say, I've yet to do a, a, a deep dive. I've been relying a lot on what I can find online, uh, just the way things are. Um, and often what you'll find is, or what I found is a lot of examples where it is the very simple form of the, you know, the vocables, the terms of endearment and um, the, the the order of banishment. So I have found a number of versions where it's that, that one where I'm giving out about the churl's wife and, and these kind of things. But um, yeah, it's I'm I'm still working on finding, I suppose, more more of the versions where there's more to say about them. And, and I'm really intrigued by that idea that Sarah Neil Oyram says every everybody had their own version and you could add what you wanted to it. So um yes, I'm still looking into it. And if you have any tips, anybody, I'd <laughs> happily welcome them. I have a quick question. If uh, there the chair says there's time. Uh, yeah, it's time for one. Go for it. All right. Uh, just a quick question because you referred to uh, using the boogeyman. Is it a particular figure or you're talking about the concept of someone taking away uh, the child if the child is not good or does not stay in bed? Yeah. Well, if they use this word bow bow and bow on its own is, is um, and somebody else will be able to say this more. <laughs> succinctly than me or um bow on its own is one of the the war figures that comes down as a crow um um but it's got strong connections to the other world uh so the translation that i found a lot for it is is just boogeyman but i take that as you know a lot of these sort of invaders and they might be mentioned as you know there's a, a ram with a big black ram or all these things but they have connotations of being connected to the other world um I hope that answers your question. Well, it, it's uh, helpful because, as you know, the boogeyman is an international concept, but it has a lot of variations. So I, I did not include uh, Irish boogeyman in my survey of uh, boogeyman in the, the practice of folklore. So I see that I'll need to uh, make a revision. So <laughs> <laughs> the bow is also the name for the banshee and um, death messenger so it, it's probably translated as boogeyman to make it more uh, understandable to english readers but it's not specifically the figure i think simon that you're referring to that that's what i'm after to yeah. you know, yeah. try to distinguish it in terms of the tradition because uh, you're right it does get generalized or boogeyman gets generalized and i think it's uh, worth analyzing more specifically so thank you for that. Um, again, thank you very much, Maureen, um, on, on behalf of everyone. Um, fascinating paper. And as you know, as Steph said, really wonderful um, performances of those lullabies made it quite magical to listen to. Thank you.